Is the bar really that low? Is the bar in hell? Is it underground? Today I'm going to be talking about some of the books that I read in the month of August because I have decided to split my monthly book wrap-ups into two parts. I have just been reading way too many books and I had too many thoughts. I do want to say before we begin that Book of the Month is sponsoring this video. Book of the Month is a super popular and fast-growing online book service. Their team vets hundreds of books each month and then gives a curated list of new and early release books. You can skip any month, any time, and you don't have to pay any extra fees for that. But let me show you what books they have for September. We have the very shiny Transcendent Kingdom by Yagi Yazi, a contemporary called Anxious People by Frederick Backman, a thriller called Winter Counts by David Wyden, a history book called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, and a contemporary called The Last Story of Mina Lee by Nancy Kim. Book of the Month really went hard this month because we have an Asian author, an indigenous author, two black authors, and a Swedish author. You know, it's good to have a white guy in the mix just for token diversity, but seriously, these selections are amazing. If you are interested in entering the giveaway, I will have a link in my description below, but if you want the books guaranteed, then you can sign up for your first box for $9.99 using my code READWITHCINDY if you go to the book of the month link in my description below. Now let's talk about more books because I don't have many hobbies. The first book that I read this month was True Colors by Kristen Hanna. I read her other book called The Nightingale a few months ago, which I rated five stars because it was a historical World War II book that made me cry towards the end, and I am just a simple soft bitch like that. True Colors is different though. It has been described as being very provocative and heart-wrenching and a compelling story about family and sisterhood. And then when I actually read it, it turned out to be more of a horse girl soap opera. Not that there's anything wrong with that because I do love me some drama. However, I ended up reading this book two stars. The story focuses on these three sisters who have banded together and become close friends since the death of their mother when they were at an early age. There is the older sister named Winona who is the best lawyer in town but she is constantly seeking for her father's approval and she knows that she'll never get it because she is an overweight bookworm. This is literally how the synopsis describes her. She's like the less popular one. She is very insecure and has low self-esteem about being fat. Obviously, the younger sister, Vivianne, is the beautiful, perfect sister with long blonde hair, gorgeous legs, the apple of the father's eye. The middle sister, Aurora, is just there. She's described as like the peacekeeper. So whenever they're fighting, she's always like, you guys stop fighting. We're supposed to be sisters. But then she doesn't really do anything more beyond that. Like I thought she would have more of a story arc, but she really didn't. She was just in the background the whole time. They were duking it out a lot because the older sister the entire time was so insecure about the younger one that she would lash out and be super passive aggressive against Vivi Ann. And the reason why she starts doing that is because there is a guy that shows up in her life who was her child childhood best friend and she was in love with him but then he falls for Vivian instead so he asks her out and then she's like uh okay sure because she's like the type of person that goes with the flow and she's like I mean I don't know what love is so I'll just say yes you seem like a nice dude you're probably a cuck but whatever. Winona gets really mad about that shit. She acts super jealous and vindictive and passive aggressive towards the younger sister. The middle sister is like hey why don't you actually communicate how you're feeling to Vivian because if she actually knew how you were feeling then she wouldn't be dating the guy anyway. And then Winona's just like, no, I'm gonna be passive aggressive the entire time. And that follows through even when the guy proposes to Vivian because he's such a cuck for her. And again, cause she's the one that goes with the flow. She's like, I mean, sure, I guess I'll marry you, you vanilla ass boring bitch. And then Winona just gets so pissed off even though she never mentioned her own feelings anyway. The plot really begins when their father hires a new worker for their horse ranch. He is a Native American man who is seen as like a bad boy because he has a sketchy criminal past. He's had an abusive childhood which makes him prone to violence. He's bad news. You shouldn't get close to him. So naturally, Vivienne is like, hmm, maybe I'm not into white dudes. <laughs> maybe I'm into some spice. He starts seducing her even though he knows that she is engaged to another man. But he's like, I know you don't really like him. I know he's just a cuck. How about you go sleep with me instead? And she's like, 
all right and then basically they have an affair and that becomes the drama of the town there is betrayal there is courtroom drama there is prison time there's a hate crime and there is a lot of drama which again i don't mind what i do mind is the way that the characters were written the sisters were described as such caricatures because we have the blonde pretty popular one and the other one is smart but she's fat and jealous and has low self-esteem the story revolves so much around the sisters being jealous over each other over a guy and that just felt icky to me. The constant emphasis of how overweight and insecure that she was made me feel uncomfortable because it felt like such an exaggeration and it felt like the only personality to this character. I'm not even sure if the author herself is fat. I decided to look her up and she just seems like a blonde lady to me so if anything she looks similar to Vivianne the pretty sister. So it really just felt like the character was reduced to a stereo Type. She's portrayed as super insecure and bitchy and always thinking, oh, no guy will ever love me because I'm fat. And obviously that's my only character trait. My sister is a skinny legend, so I hate her. It's okay to feel insecure about your body. A lot of people do. But the way that it was written, there wasn't really much growth or development. I started recording some of the quotes because once I started realizing that this was a pattern, I just had to write down all the ridiculous shit. So when I read out loud these quotes, please keep in mind that this was in the second half of the story all the way to the very end. On page 218, there's a scene after Winona gets caught stress eating ice cream because obviously when an overweight girl is stressed out, she has to eat ice cream as a coping mechanism. She gets caught by the younger sister. Some context about those two is that when their mom was still alive, their mom would give them nicknames called P and Bean. You know, like the cute little foods that they have. So after she gets caught stress eating ice cream, Winona asks, how do you think mom knew we would look like when she gave us those nicknames. You're the bean, right? How does she know I would be the round fat pea? Who would just think that? Like someone calls you a P and you think, oh, it must be because I'm literally a fucking circle. On page 326, she looks at her body and she notices some flaps that she doesn't really like. And she says to herself, no swimming for you, fat girl. Page 337, she is about to go on a date with a guy and her sisters give her a makeover. She sees the results in the mirror and she says, wow, too bad he can't just take my head out to dinner. Implying that her face is the only thing that's pretty and the rest of her body is not. Her inner monologue says, absent liposuction, this was as good as she was likely to look. Page 379, she is making a joke. There's some scene where a character was asking why didn't she run. She sardonically replies, I'm fat. I can only run so fast. The last quote that I will read is from page 467 and this is from a 500 page book. So this was within the last 50 pages of the book. You would think that there is some growth in the character by now where she learns to love herself or at least stop fucking talking like she needs to be a headless bob. Some time has passed by this point and she's like reflecting on her growth. She says, I'm actually losing weight for the first time since sixth grade. Maybe I'll get lucky and finally get pretty. Another character that didn't sit right with me was the Native American love interest. He was portrayed as someone who is devilish and dangerous and seductive, and he was gonna be a homewrecker and steal all your white girls. Any guy who tries to flirt or tempt a girl who is already married automatically becomes sleazy. He's meant to be a sympathetic character, and I did care for him and his well-being, but the fact that he was the only indigenous character, I just think that there are a lot of implications if you write one indigenous character in the entire book and you make him a homewrecker that steals the white girls away from the noble white men. I honestly can't speak for the representation and whether the characters were actually written well because I'm not indigenous or fat. I'm an Asian skinny legend. Still, the fact that these characters were written in this way that felt so much like caricatures to me just completely took me out of the story. It prevented me from fully embracing the book and the drama because I was just so turned off by how some of the lines were written and how some of the characters were depicted. The next book that I read is a memoir called The Glass Castle. This has been compared to Educated, another memoir that I really loved last year. It is similar in the sense where both authors are writing about how fucked up their families are. Their parents are really, really fucking weird. They have a very non-conformist way of thinking and lifestyle. In the beginning, they kind of lived like nomads where they were moving from different town to town. It seems like these parents are just very free-spirited and they don't like to follow 
flow through conformity and rigid structures that society has placed upon them. But you start to see how neglectful their lifestyles and parenting styles are. They would let their kids starve because they didn't cook any meals. Literally, the first chapter begins with Jeanette when she was three years old accidentally burning herself because she was trying to boil hot dog sausages. The dad is an alcoholic, so he would steal money from his kids to fuel his addiction. And then he would just like disappear for days and then come back drunk. There are so many things that they did that were so wrong and neglectful. But at the same time, Jeanette describes different qualities that they possess that made them really interesting and unique individuals. So it's very bizarre to see this dynamic of them being very adamant about their beliefs on something. For example, they don't believe in going to the hospital and they would rather just go to a spiritual doctor instead, which is like, you know, some kooky shit. But then at the same time, the dad is incredibly intelligent with statistics, physics, and engineering. He can literally build shit from scratch. The mom is a painter and a writer and she's able to create all of these things and artwork. So on one hand, you're looking at these talented prodigies, but on the other hand, you're reading a scene about the mom literally spreading mayo on the main girl's head like she's Ed from 90 Day Fiance. I felt really sad for the kids having to fend for themselves and literally having to offer to budget for the parents just so that they wouldn't make sure that they would have no money or no food to eat. It's just depressing to see kids having to fend for themselves like that. But at the same time, the kids, especially Jeanette Walls, have so much grit and independence to them that they don't let anybody fuck with them. There are so many instances where people try to assault them and touch them inappropriately. Their go-to reaction is just screaming in their faces and being like, don't fucking touch me, you fucking pervert, and just like fighting and fending for themselves. There's a part where Jeanette finally saves up to move to New York to escape from her family. When people try to mug her or assault her because she's like, you know, a single woman in this big city, she will literally fight them back, tooth and nail, just screaming and clawing at them. And it's just like, oh my God, this bitch has balls of steel. So I felt like it was an interesting reflection of how awful and complicated your childhood can be. But at the same time, it influences so much of who you are today. And I was able to relate to that a lot because as some of you know, I have had experiences with my parents dealing from my sister and me and dealing with a drinking and gambling addiction. So I was able to relate to some of like the dysfunctional components of growing up like that. And I especially understand how despite those awful things that kind of made me who I am today, where I became very independent and self-sufficient and I'm really, really good with my money and all those things wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't experienced those awful things. I rated this four stars because I did enjoy reading those interesting family dynamics and the complicated familial love that she had towards her parents. The reason why I didn't rate this five stars though is because I felt like the book really just recounted everything that happened. I really wanna know more personal insights about what she was feeling and experiencing and all the complicated feelings she had towards her parents. And I didn't get that. It was just very straightforwardly telling you, here's all the crazy shit that happened rather than here's how I processed all the crazy shit that happened. And I'm more interested in the latter. I did watch the movie adaptation for The Glass Castle afterward. I did see that some people not quite like the movie as much because they did kind of romanticize the parents a little bit. But I still felt like that was accurate because in the eyes of Jeanette Walls when she was a child, she did see the dad as like a hero. The movie filled in the missing pieces that I had wanted, which was more of the emotional turmoil that the main character had, thinking whether she should reject her family or just accept the fact that this is like a part of her and part of who she is. And in case you're wondering, because the two books do get compared a lot, I still like educated better as a memoir and I might be biased because the author there was just like, you know what, fuck my family. <laughs> Jeanette Walls is still like on good terms with her family and I think that was kind of interesting to see how she still possesses that love for them despite all the awful stuff that happens but I like how the author for Educated was just like nah fuck this I'm out. I think depending on how you deal with your family that could help you decide which book you would rather read. After that I read a romance book called Get a Life Chloe Brown. This follows Chloe who is a website designer with a chronic illness. The plot begins when she has a near-death experience and it makes her realize holy shit, I need to get a life because if I died, I would have died having not done anything cool throughout my life. And so she writes this list. There are various things like going camping, traveling the world with only a carry-on luggage, riding a motorcycle, enjoying a drunken night out. Just various things like that that she hadn't done before due to her chronic illness holding her back. The love interest is 
her apartment manager named Red. He is the handyman of their apartment complex. He rides a motorcycle, of course, but he's also a painter by night. So that's how you know he has a sensitive side. But she gives him an offer where she will help design and code his website for him to sell his artwork and promote himself in exchange for him to help her out with fulfilling the items on her list. I rated the book four stars because I thought it was super cute and sweet and steamy, which is all the ingredients that I want in a romance book. There was a lot of banter that I thought was amusing and very natural between the characters. And there was a lot of pining because Red was so unabashedly in love with Chloe and we fucking love to see it. I like that her chronic illness was brought up a lot. It wasn't like the main plot of the story, but it was a part of her as a character and the things that she has had to experience and the hardships that she's had. He was very understanding and gentle and patient with her. So that was another very sweet thing to see throughout the book. This is actually one of Chanel's favorite books. She kept on raving about the love interest and I finally read it so I could hit her up and be like, you know what? I totally fucking get it. He's hot as hell. You can totally tell that Red is hot, not just in physique, but like as a person. He really radiated big dig energy. I really wish that I had taken a screenshot, but now it's too hard to find it. But there's a point where I was messaging Chanel and we both said the same thing at the same time where Chanel said, I know he's packing down there. And I said, I know he has a big dick. And we sent it to each other at the same time. And I was like, not us literally saying the same thing and being thirsty bitches. The reason why I didn't rate it five stars is because of the last one third of the story. The characters have to have some kind of conflict or breakup that adds dilemma to the story before they get back together again. It was just completely unnecessary. It felt so contrived and petty. The good thing about it is that the characters do realize that they fucked up like right after it happens. It doesn't get dragged out too long because it gets resolved quickly. But again, that's like a double edged sword because it just adds to how rushed it feels towards the end. It's still cute though. And I would definitely read the sequel, Danny Brown, sometime soon. I actually heard that one was better, so I'm looking forward to that. The next book that I read, and the final one that I will cover for this video, is My Dark Vanessa. This book is about a naive teenage girl who ends up having an affair with her older teacher, who I believe is in his 40s, and he's fucking nasty and sweaty and ugly. And I'm not even saying that to be joking around. That's literally how he's described. The book explores the psychological dynamics of the relationship, and also explores how disgusted I can feel by that fucking teacher. The book follows two timelines, one where Vanessa is a 15 year old girl navigating high school and the other one where she is a woman in her 30s and she has to grapple some new allegations that have recently come out about that teacher who has sexually been involved with other students. What's sad is that this happens so often because when you are growing up as a girl, you don't really know any better. I mean, she becomes attracted to her teacher because she's very lonely and troubled then she feels like he is the only person who really sees her. Even though he's doing like basic ass shit, like she gives him her notebook of poetry that she wrote so that he can flip through and read it. And she thinks to herself, no one has ever touched my notebook before. And I'm like, bitch, is the bar really that low? Is the bar in hell? Is it underground? The affair starts off with these really small, kind of innocuous interactions at first. First major red flag to me was when he was reading over an essay that she wrote that he was grading and then he calls her up to his desk and he has a little comment on some specific line that she wrote. He asked her, did you mean to sound sexy here? And I'm like, bitch, what? This is a high school English curriculum. What kind of sexy line could she write about fucking To Kill a Mockingbird? Where the fuck is the electric chair? Then he starts making more weird comments. There's a part where there's this Halloween dance that the school host, she comes up dressed up as a cat and then he says, look at you, little pussy cat. And I was like, there's another scene where he shows up and she gets surprised because she didn't expect him there. He says, you look like a startled little fawn. And I'm like, stop fucking comparing her to animals, you nasty. Don't ruin furries for me. How dare you slander the furry community. We do not accept you. Don't be comparing cute little animals to your nasty ass. And she really doesn't understand like the repercussions of what's going on when they become physically intimate. Because again, she's a 15 year old girl. She's never been intimate with the person before. She does a hand job for the first time 
time. And in her point of view, she is comparing it to a dog that is gagging out garbage. And I'm like, oh, that's quite relevant because I also feel like a dog that's gagging out garbage. The book definitely does not hold back with showing all the nasty things that happen. My concern coming into this book was that I did not want to be reading trauma porn. Like I don't want to read and rate a book highly just because it tackles serious issues and just shows a bunch of horrible things because I don't think that necessarily constitutes a good book. However, I think that the way that the author approached these different layers of the themes that she was going for, I think she pulled off well. I have not read Lolita, but what I do know about Lolita is that it is written from the man's perspective. He is kind of seen as like the sympathetic hero and that he couldn't help himself. When you read My Dark Vanessa, you finally get it from the girl's perspective. You finally see how deluded the guy was. The lies that he tells himself, the cognitive dissonance to just live with himself and think that he's not doing anything wrong. This teacher throughout the book fucking loves to make himself a victim. He loves to make it seem like Vanessa has all the power and he was just a guy who fell in love and he couldn't help it. He thinks it's okay because she consented to it, but then we finally get her perspective and we see the dynamics interactions where she often felt like she had to say the right thing in order to appease him. I think it's very accurate to feel like you are not a victim or you don't believe that you are a victim because you make up all of these gray areas of how you could be at fault and how you could be responsible for it. She has to view it in a very romanticized way because if she doesn't, then she has to confront with the reality that all of this is really fucked up. There's a specific line where she says, I have to say it's a love story because if not, then what is it? This is my life. This is my whole life. I just found it to be so tragic. Also, the therapist that she talks to in the story needs a fucking pay raise. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. The therapist was the only adult that did right by her. Everyone else was fucking complicit and terrible. But that was like a layer that I liked about the book. It wasn't just about the teacher and the student getting into this affair. It wasn't like in this silo. The side characters each contributed in their own way to the story. It goes beyond just the victim and the abuse. It goes more into the people that were there. It goes more into our culture and how we were raised. What ultimately encouraged my rating to bump up to five stars is how the ending was handled. I'm not gonna say what happens. I will say that what I liked about it is that when we read a story, we usually think a resolution is like this exciting, dramatic showdown where the bad guy finally falls and then the good guy wins and prevails forever. I liked that it was realistic. It's more of a quiet ending. There's no epic showdown and you don't get all of the closure that you want. But I think that is very much how real life is because you're not gonna get closure for the trauma that you experience. All you can really do is just pick up the pieces and figure out how to move forward from here. And that's all I gotta say. I will be back for part two where I talk about the other books I read, including Bringing Down the Duke, You Had Me at Ola, There Will Come a Darkness, 10,000 Doors of January, and The Disaster Tourist. Goodbye. Well, in a minute, I'll be stoned, gonna get it to your core.